Hi everyone, my name is Nikita and welcome back to my channel, or if you're first time here, welcome. I'm a full-time therapist in Toronto and on this channel, we talk about diversity and inclusion of BIPOC stories, especially South Asian stories, both in literature and in real life. So on this channel, you can expect a lot of book reviews, book talks, as well as my podcast called Brown People Problems. So for today's video, I wanted to share with you three books that I think you should be reading in 2023. If there's no other books that you're going to read, try to at least pick a couple of these three. And as is the theme with everything on my channel, these are centered around, most of them are centered around the BIPOC experiences, uh, BIPOC stories, and one of them uh, can actually be related uh, to BIPOC stories. First one here, we have got this tiny little book. It's quite skinny. This is Dear Ijiawele or A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions by Chimamanda Adichie. This is, like I said, small book, but this is a lovely book that we'll be talking about today. If you don't know who Chimamanda Adichie is, she is a feminist, an author who spends, um, a lot of time I believe moving back and forth between the States and Nigeria, uh, which is her place of origin. And she's written a number of books. She's also written Americana, which I believe is a fiction. And we should all be feminists. I love that one. And this one, I've had this for years. This is my favorite. This is something that I kind of always just keep on my bookshelf. And this in particular is essentially just 15 suggestions on how to raise a feminist daughter. This book came about when Chimamanda's friend reached out to her uh, who had just had a daughter and had asked her, you know, I need um, some support in raising my daughter to be a feminist. And essentially this book was the letter that Chimamanda had written back to her friend and it includes 15 suggestions. The reason why I think this is so relevant to this video is because a lot of the suggestions that she has on here are applicable to the larger community of women globally but specifically to a lot of women of color and at least a lot of South Asian women of color, in my opinion. I'm gonna pull up a random suggestion here for you. Okay, so there's a suggestion here that says, never speak of marriage as an achievement. Find ways to make clear to your daughter that marriage is not an achievement, nor is it what she should aspire to. A marriage can be happy or unhappy, but it is not an achievement. We condition girls to aspire to marriage and we do not condition boys to aspire for marriage. So this already creates a terrible imbalance at the start. The girls will grow up to be women preoccupied with marriage and boys will not. So very small suggestions, but they're absolutely lovely. She really introduces a critical way of looking at a lot of what we've been taught, a lot of belief systems that we carry with us, a lot of, a lot of ways in which the societies are generally structured around expectations of women. If you're interested more in this book, I will link for you my whole video. I have done a detailed uh, two videos, including podcast episodes uh, on this book. I think it is absolutely lovely. And you can see on the back here as well, where it talks about all the different suggestions to teach her self-resilience, teach her to love books, never speak of marriage as an achievement give her a sense of identity, it matters. This book came out a few years ago, but I find it to be so applicable. Some of the ideas that the suggestions to tackle in here are, um, you know, talking to your daughters about sex, and not just from a place of consent, but also just from like a place of sex, educating her about her body and uh, teaching her the right language around sex. Another suggestion is about helping your daughter find a sense of identity. Um, another suggestion is about helping her let go of this idea of likability, which we know is so prominent in so many uh, BIPOC communities that women have to be really likable by everyone, which creates a lot of people pleasing tendencies, a lot of self-sacrifice and, and all that good stuff. So, you know, this is something that is one of those books that you could gift to anybody in your life and they would really appreciate it. This is a great suggestion. I would check it out. Next up, we have Girls That Unrest by Simran Kaur. If you're not already sick of me talking about this book, then I appreciate you, but I think everyone in my personal life is really sick of me talking about this book. I have made another video where I talk a lot about this book. I will definitely link it right now. Uh, but this is a lovely book. Simran Kaur is a um, 
Sikh woman living in New Zealand. She's an author of this book. She also has a podcast by the same name. It's a lovely podcast, check it out. But this is a really unique investing book. And I find that whether you're a beginner or you are maybe um, someone who has a lot more experience in investing and understanding how the financial markets work, this would still be a lovely read for you. And that's because of Simran's focus on systemic socio-political barriers that are in place that make it difficult for women to engage in this type of learning, in this type of exchange of information, in entering the financial markets. This book really, you know, she takes you through uh, what is an ethical investor, um, what is your risk profile, understanding that about yourself, um, uh, how the market moves, why the market moves, what is fire, what are the different types of ways of investing? So, uh, you know, what are ETFs versus buying single stocks and things like that. So it's highly focused on just taking these seemingly complex and overwhelming concepts and making them so much more accessible. That's why I absolutely love this book. She's also got a bunch of actionable steps at the end of each chapter. So you can take all this information and practically apply it to your life as well and to your current scenario. One thing that I was not expecting to be part of this book and right off the bat is, is in here is this focus on the culture of shame around money and around finances and how typically in a lot of uh, communities, a lot of people of color communities, women are not necessarily enabled to talk a lot about finances. Um, it's a topic that's mainly more reserved for boys in the family. And the first couple chapters in here, she really, before she dives into any of the finance information, she really talks about um, intergenerational trauma. She talks about what are some of the structural socio-political uh, barriers in place to women accessing this information, understanding this information, and that all goes down to, a lot of it goes down to how women are raised, how women are perceived, what roles in society women are prescribed, and so that piece in here was a really refreshing take. I have certainly read a lot of finance books. Uh, I have personally found that information to be quite dry in the past, and some of the books I've honestly really loved, like The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, I believe. It's a great book, but this book really goes above and beyond and is unlike any other that I have read. Another thing that was really refreshing in here to read was whenever she was showing case examples or just discussing real life examples of people looking to invest, the names she would she would use are very inclusive. So you see a lot of South Asian names, you see a lot of Asian names, you see a lot of people of color names in here. And it's probably one of the only books I have ever come across that has that type of inclusivity. So it's very, very gratifying and satisfying to experience as a woman of color. And lastly, for this video, I have this monster of a book. This is called The Myth of Normal by Dr. Gabor Mate. This is everywhere right now. This is a nonfiction book as like the other ones and you may have seen this everywhere. I'm still making my way through this book. I'm not entirely done and I also have it in audiobook form so I'm listening to it while I'm reading it which helps for me to integrate information for me. If you're not familiar with Dr. Mate, he is an addictions and trauma therapist and researcher and really a pioneer in this field from Vancouver, BC. He is now recognized as a global authority um, on trauma and healing and how trauma impacts the body. He has contributed to a lot of research and a lot of practical work when it comes to working with trauma survivors. In this book and particularly The Myth of Normal, he really talks about how stress is really normalized in our societies and how stress manifests in the body. So there's lots of chapters and the book is divided into five different parts, but essentially some of the things that are really mentioned in here are research on how stress impacts the body, for example, how stress impacts the body's immunity, how most of us struggle between the need for attachment and also the need for authenticity in our communities. It talks about the mind and body connection uh, as well, which is a hot topic right now, but it's just this idea that our mind and body are not two separate entities, but they are one and they're connected. And whatever happens in the body also has an impact on the mind and vice versa. One part that I really appreciated in this book is he presents a totally different perspective on illness. And he talks about how illness and disease is not just something that happens to us out of the blue in 
you know, the middle of the day, but it's more of a progression and disease is a progression over time that is influenced by how we live our lives. Disease can certainly make itself known immediately or not immediately, but suddenly with a tremendous impact, but it's something that develops over time. He does a really good job of also not assigning blame to people, right? So I think when we read a lot of self-help books that tell us, well, we are responsible for our circumstances, that can feel really blamey and that can feel uh, quite like inappropriate, right? So he doesn't shame, he doesn't blame. The whole perspective on this book is empowerment. So if we can see ourselves and our habits and how we live our lives and how we process our emotions as the central focal point of our health, we can start to take steps to live life differently and undo a lot of what our body has already um, experienced. He also talks a lot about something that uh, those of us in, in the field of therapy and social work, we have always talked about, but this is idea of afflictions, disease usually comes out of our body trying to adapt to the traumas that it has experienced, the stressors it has experienced. So he's really reframing here how we look at abnormal and what really is abnormal, what really is normal. This really fits in with, I think, a lot of the experiences of BIPOC communities, especially when we look at the South Asian communities who have experienced a lot of intergenerational trauma, they've experienced a lot of uh, partition trauma, they have experienced a lot of colonial trauma. All of that reshapes our nervous system, it reshapes our capacity for stress, it reshapes how we live our lives, what belief systems we form, how we pass that down our generations. So while this book is not necessarily focused around BIPOC stories, nor is this a BIPOC author, I think this has huge implications. Um, and it, there's a transferability onto the experiences of BIPOC individuals. If you enjoy learning more about the mind and the body and how stress manifests, or if you need a different perspective on disease and what is constituted as normal or abnormal in our world, then definitely give this a read. I think this is great. It is massive. It's huge. Like you can see, it's not a quick read. It's over 500 pages, but anything this man writes is worth it. So definitely pick this up if you're into that. So that's it. Those were my three books that I think you should read in 2023. All three of them are nonfiction. All three of them um, have a great unique focus in, in different things that are applicable to the lives of BIPOC individuals. And if you want me to do a focused video on any of these books, let me know down below. I would be happy to do it. If you think there's any nonfiction books or any fiction books for that matter that you think I should definitely read in 2023, please link them down below. I would definitely want to check them out and if you enjoyed this video don't forget to hit like and subscribe and you might enjoy this other video suggestion here as well thank you for tuning in i will see you next time